do think that Cowbridge doesn't make enough of him. Mm. Uh, he is a hugely important character in Welsh history, who tends to be dismissed a little bit as uh, that forger, you know. Whereas actually he is a character that we should be, as inhabitants of the town, <clears throat> enormously proud. And I warn you, if you get into Yolo Morganog, it can become a marriage-threatening obsession. <laughs> His life story is absolutely amazing. It's wrong to call him a forger. You know, some of the other famous forgers who are perhaps better known, like Thomas Chatterton, a great hero of uh, the Romantic. Thomas Chatterton forged one poet's work, Rowley, yeah? Um, Yolo Morganuk forged an entire literary tradition. <laughs> um, it's not my phrase to say that, you know, okay, maybe he was a forger, mm -hmm. but he was a perpetrator of the greatest act, the most successful act of literary forgery in European history. <laughs> uh, now, that is worth celebrating. <laughs> I have a visit from Peggy who brings me news of my father and our infant girls. She brings supplies of paper, pens, ink, and, as I ask, she brings my favourite books and bread, cheese and apples, and a supply of laudanum. He then peopled the cell with characters from his imagination. Real bards, long, long since dead, and he filled their mouths <laughs> with new poetry written in their style, proving the original forgery that he had just created, until the cell was full of the spirits of long dead medieval bards. <laughs> he arrives in my cell dressed in simple country attire, but with the demeanor of a king. He greets me in the simple, honest language of a son of Glamorgan, but his swagger is the swagger of one who knows the truth. He will have no part of my incarceration. A jail cell is no place for this free spirit. He takes me out to country fairs and village greens, to maypole dances and sheep shearings. He is the king of the pastoral romance, willing to make a fool of himself for the love of any pretty shepherdess. That letter, I have to say, that letter from Will Tabor, written by him, is a real letter that does exist. And it illustrates the way in which Yolo seemed to have this amazing ability to divide his brain in two, and have half of it living in a world of fantasy and half living in a world of reality, uh, by which he could forge something, receive it, and react to it as if he'd never seen it before. <laughs> Not only that, but sometimes when he forged poems, uh, a couple of days later, he would then write a critical analysis of the poem, uh, and even, on some occasions, doubt its veracity. <laughs> what he was doing at the time was, of course, indulging in, well, a sport that goes on even now, which is the reinvention of myth as national mythology. You take old stories, you take bits of history, and you create national mythology. And the Welsh have got to thank Yolo Morganog for the biggest part of the, of the, the national mythology uh, which people used in Victorian times, and an awful lot of which we still believe today. Most people who've read the book so far find themselves actually sympathizing endlessly with Peggy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, the woman who was foolish enough to hitch herself to this changeable, difficult, temperamental, tempestuous individual. Doubt thou the stars of fire. Doubt that the sun doth move. Doubt truth to be a liar. But never doubt I love. She looks impressed. Did you write that? No. <laughs> That's Shakespeare. <laughs> Hamlet. She shakes her head in disbelief. That's typical. 
No one ever knows if you're being you or someone else. And even then, who is it that you're pretending to be this time? Do you know who you are? Probably not. <laughs> what Yola did was to turn the Eisteddfod from being a poetry competition uh, and music competition uh, into being the first national institution that Wales had. Um, and that's a huge step. It also has, you know, you have to say, political significance. We meet to pray, to praise God, to initiate new members of our order, and to recite poetry. None of these acts require a license. I have reason to suspect you of treasonous practices. In which case you should present your evidence. I have been examined on this subject by better men than you, Mr. Lloyd, including the Prime Minister himself. <coughs> if you believe you can do better than he, then arrest me. Otherwise step aside and allow us to proceed peacefully. Walter Lloyd hesitates, then steps aside, cursing me under his breath. As we pass, he shouts, We know you of old, Edward Williams, we know you of old. Son of an honest tradesman and a mother of good family, how did you end up staging these pantomimes? The novelist has this opportunity to go places uh, that the historian cannot or, or dare not. Uh, you can actually surmise, you can actually just push that possibility a little bit further. You can, you've also got this enormous privilege of writing the dialogue. Nobody was there with a tape recorder, you know. And that degree of interpretation is, I think, where the excitement comes in. How, how, how much is true? How much, how much is it? It's all true! <laughs> Maybe now the Welsh have a choice. An alternative to the oppression of the Union Jack. A path that can lead instead to a nation at peace. Valuing freedom, fraternity, and the word of the Lord above all else. I am content with my creation. My truth against the world. Let us see what the world makes of it. <laughs>